Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. My guest today, Dr. Aaron Davis, has one of the greatest titles of anyone I have ever interviewed in the last four years of doing this podcast. He is head of coffee research at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. He is also co-author of two new scientific papers which demonstrate that many species of what is known as wild coffee are threatened with extinction. And that, of course, is due in large part to climate change. As Dr. Davis explains, we coffee drinkers don't generally consume wild coffee. Rather, there are two species of coffee that are not wild that most of us drink, called Arabica and Robusta. But as Dr. Davis explains, the fate of these two species of coffee we drink and that of the 124 species of wild coffee are closely linked. Aaron Davis also holds the title of Senior Research Leader at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, and we kick off talking more generally about the science of coffee before having a longer conversation about the broader social and economic implications of his research into climate change and coffee extinction. So I'm recording this at 10 in the morning. So far, I've had two double espressos and one very strong single espresso. I think I'm done for the day. Not quite sure. And I should say, I do think my coffee consumption does make me a better podcast host. So if you want to support my habit, please become a premium subscriber to the podcast and support the show on Patreon. There's a link in the description field of this podcast episode, which will tell you the rewards you can earn by supporting the show and feeding my addiction. All right. Now, here is my conversation with head of coffee research, Dr. Aaron Davis. So nearly all of uh, the world's production came from Arabica until the end of the 1800s. Everything was going quite nicely. We'd been cultivating Arabica for hundreds of years. And then a pest emerged in Southeast Asia and Southern Asia. And within a very short space of time, 20 to 30 years, it pretty much wiped out Arabica, Arabica production. And what we did was to bring in another species um, to, to, to make up the significant shortfall. Uh, we started with Liberica from West Africa. It grew well, it had some resistance, but nobody wanted to drink the coffee because it didn't taste very good. Uh, and then a bit later, uh, particularly in the early 20th century, um, Robusta was found from uh, Central and Lower West Africa. And that was very, very tolerant to uh, coffee leaf rust, uh, highly productive, and it also tasted pretty good. So um, it it, uh, filled all those production gaps um, in in places where Arabica had failed. And and so sort of the history of coffee teaches us that finding these other varieties in the wild are sort of essential to uh, the survival of coffee as a whole. Uh, you put it very well. And um, what's happened is we've, in the case of Robusta, we've adopted a new whole new species. Uh, in the case of Arabica, we've either um, used the genes from Robusta or um, we've used other uh, Arabica um, genetic resources from the wild uh, for disease resistance, but also for taste and taste uh, brings increased prices, and that is good for farmers, of course. So, so you, you've talked about the sort of two kind of consumer-facing non-wild variety, species of of coffees. Mm. What, what's wild coffee like what, when you reference that? Because I know a lot of your research, which we'll discuss in a minute, focuses on wild coffee species. What is wild mm. coffee? So our our work is completely focused on, on wild coffee. And wild coffee are those plants which occur naturally in the wild. They're not, they're not being planted. Um, they're not being um, manipulated in any major way by man. They're, you know, they're part of the natural ecosystem. 
And where are they found? Where's wild coffee found? So coffee, uh, the, the genus, and, and it's 124 species, is found um, across what we call the old world, or used to call the old world, from Africa through Madagascar, India, southern tropical Asia, um, Papua New Guinea, and even in um, northern Australia. So but at least three of, continents. So it's so it's everywhere. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's not everywhere. It's it's not in it's not in the New World. It's not in uh, not in central central South America. Central South America. No, no, no wild okay. species there. No. Okay. Um. And and, and what has you, so you uh, participated in two studies recently published into the uh, survivability and the probability of extinction of wild coffee species. Can you explain uh, what these, how these two studies were conducted and what you found? Yeah, of course. So I think, you know, going back to, to uh, when I first started in coffee over 20 years ago, it really just surprised me that here was a major global commodity um, that we knew a fair, a fair bit about. We know, knew so little about plants in the wild. And it was very clear from an early stage that a lot of them were actually very difficult to find and very rare in the wild. So right, you know, back then, um, you know, it was clear that we needed to understand um, how many species there were in the world, uh, where they came from, and, you know, what were their uh, extinction risks. Um, so that's, you know, that's, it's been a long, it's been a long program. Uh, and in order to do a, a, a sort of gold standard extinction risk assessment, you need to apply the IUCN red list, rest list, red list uh, criteria. And that's exactly, exactly what we've, we've just done. What is that criteria and, for those of us who uh, don't know the lingo? Yeah, so you, what you have to do is find out where it occurs, um, in, in, you know, really quite precisely. Uh, and you have to understand uh, the, the area where it occurs in the air and, and the extent to, uh, to which it occurs. And then you look at, uh, uh, if you can, if you have the data, uh, at how that uh, has been influenced by um, negative factors such as land use change, um, such as, you know, uh, encroaching agriculture, etc., deforestation, and then put that through, let's say, these criteria, which, which are very rigid, to, to, to say, for example, has this population been negatively impacted? Is the population reducing? Uh, how much is it reduced to? And what would it take to actually push that species um, to extinction? So, it's, it's, as I've said, it's an extinction risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And 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 so, what did you find when you uh, applied those methods to uh, to wild arabica coffee? Arabica coffee. Yeah. So the the, the, the there was one paper which looks uh, at all 124 species uh, without factoring in climate change. Now, we're really interested in Arabica coffee, so and we had great data for Arabica coffee. So what we're able to do is to take uh, all the, the, the usual um, metrics for looking at extinction risk, but also add in climate projections. Uh, and, but that was to say just for Arabica coffee. And what we what we found is that uh, if you don't factor in climate change, uh, Arabica coffee in the wild, the wild species, is actually not threatened. It should you know it should be fine across this uh, you know the rest of the century and beyond. If, however, you factor in climate change, then it shifts up two um, categories within that system to become. A threatened plant. So Arabica is now officially uh, recognised as an endangered species because of climate change. Because of climate change, what we say in the other paper, where we're looking at all the other species, um, is that uh, we've got a sixty percent uh, extinction risk across those species. So, so six out of ten are, you know, threatened with extinction. And that if we were, if we could apply climate change projections to those species, it's, it's likely that we're going to see a shift uh, again into more uh, threatened categories. So, we, you know, although we've got a very, very high extinction risk 
for those species, there's a good chance if we factored in climate change, it would push it even further. I, I so, want to yeah. ask you, yeah, no, I, I want to ask you about the implications of your research, like coffee growers and coffee consumers around the world. But before that, mm. can you explain, like, what's the relationship between the extinction of a species of, say, wild arabica? And climate change is it um, that you know th that that sort of the 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 land upon which this you know these these coffee plants grow is no longer able mm. to sustain the coffee plant like what what's what happens yeah absolutely so uh, a lot of I, sh I should have pointed out that most coffee species occur in forest mm -hmm. a lot of coffee species have very restricted ranges that means they occur in very small areas like the conditions uh, have to be just right. And, and yeah, so if you have something that's already in a restricted area, a lot of coffee species or most coffee species uh, exist within a very narrow climatic envelope. And that means that they need very specific conditions to keep them alive. Hmm. Uh, so they're really sensitive to, to climate uh, and climate change. If they're, and, and then if they're in a small area, that's even, that's even worse because they've got nowhere to migrate to. They can't move um, as they would have been able to if, once the forests, once, uh, forests were, were much more um, extensive. So it's, it's a combination of um, deforestation, small range, and climate change all working together to make them um, extinction sensitive. So your, your research finds that, I think it's by 2088, um, that these sort of, uh, many of these coffee species will have become extinct. Um, what does that? No, no, that, no okay. that, that's sorry. That's for, that's that's the analysis for arabica. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's difficult to actually put a figure on on that for the other wild species. But based on um, observations uh, in situ in, in the places where they occur, you know, it, it doesn't take much to sort of put some even more concerning figures on some species like. You know, um, could it be ten or twenty years before this species um, becomes extinct if we don't intervene uh, very, very quickly? So, if we don't intervene, if these species do become extinct, how does that change um, both coffee consumption uh, around the world or in coffee production? Mm -hmm. How does that change the, you know, the the economic and political and and sort of consumer landscape of of coffee? Let's go back to our earlier conversation where we've already said that, you know, the coffee that we're drinking today is, has been uh, 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 made sustainable by the use of wild resources. And, you know, uh, that is pretty much systematic in, in terms of uh, right throughout the, the, the cultivation history of coffee, we have used, if not wild species, wild genetic uh, resources to, um, you know, in breeding programs, for example, to resolve specific production issues. Uh, right up to the present day, so what we see in the present day is the latest hybrids uh, incorporating wild plants uh, into the into the breeding programs to produce the coffees uh, for the next, you know, two or three decades, perhaps. Now, if you perhaps look even further. Uh, thinking about what we know of, 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 of the past, it's it's very much very likely that we'll be using those wild resources or we'll need those wild resources again and again. But now we're in an era of accelerated climate change, um, you know, huge population growth. The pressures are perhaps greater in the 21st century than they were in any preceding uh, century. So. Because like um, maybe one of those species, right, could could hold like the key, the genetic key to making some good tasting coffee that's also climate change absolutely. resistant. Yes, and we've got examples. We know there are coffees that will exist in hotter, drier conditions. Uh, species that, will, that can um, withstand longer dry seasons, and um, potentially have the flavor characteristics that are required to make it a commercial product. So we know those things exist. As they move towards extinction or become extinct, we're, we're taking off you know, potential options uh, very quickly. So we, you know, it's, uh, we've used this, these resources in the past and we'll 
certainly like are likely to need them in the future. Um, and, and it's it's also probably worth pointing out that you know coffee growing is what mostly probably done by small hold farmers in the developing world. So you're talking about like a massive, um, uh, you know, a massive industry, but the backbone of which are you know people in the developing world. Uh, that's exactly true. Uh, most of our coffee is produced from um, countries where there are smallholder farmers, one to maybe five. Uh, hectares producing coffee and, and you know, as, as I've said on many occasions, it's estimated that there may be as many one, as 100 million coffee farmers worldwide. Now that's just on the production side. If you look at the sector as a whole, um, you're, you're looking at the livelihoods of you know, many more millions of people. If you factor in people who make coffees in restaurants and cafes, and produce coffee making equipment, et cetera, et cetera, it's a huge, huge industry. Um, so, so you, you said earlier that so the the areas in which wild coffee grows are are sort of fairly limited. Um, so I'm wondering, sort of absent sort of major action on climate change, are there policy decisions that can be made in these regions um, that could mitigate the effects of climate change that could perhaps prevent the extinction of some of these uh, species? Mm. In, in particular, with respect to deforestation and land use change, absolutely. Um, you know, and as I, as I say, it's 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 all those factors working together in a negative way, um, and we see not only sort of global climate change but local climate change caused by you know burning of grasslands, for example. Um, those local um, activities can have big impacts uh, on the local climate. We see that, for example, in in South Sudan. So that there are things that can be done uh, outside of of the, the sort of super high decision making um, uh, activities, like you know reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, Ultimately, and, yeah. I mean, is, uh, is know, it like like creating protected areas, like almost like um, you would say, like marine protected areas to preserve species yes. of like coral, create like national forests and protected areas to create species of yeah. coffee. If you if you look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia's done an amazing job of already designating protected areas for conserving wild arabica. It's it's, it's already in place. Uh, that's not the case for uh, for many other parts of the world uh, or any parts of the world, in fact. Um, but and what we need to do is to look at those protected areas, look at their management. Um, improve on the management, make sure they're sourced properly, but also look at the design. Um, so our, our other study in global change biology looks at Arabica in in Ethiopia and we're saying, yes, there are uh, there, there is a scheme, a network of protected areas for Arabica coffee, but if you start to look at climate change, you need to change the design, uh, the scope, and the, the physical characteristics i.e. The, the boundaries of those reserves, so they become, you know, more uh, climate resilient. So this, so the, the species can move as the climate changes. So is there anything we consumers can do to um, perhaps help protect wild species or, uh, to put it another way, to help perhaps mitigate the negative effects of, of coffee consumption, which I, I mean, I have to imagine like a lot of coffee farms are in places that, you know, were, were formerly chopped down forests. Um, so w what, what can be done on the consumer side of things to, um, to sort of ensure the survivability of these species and to make mm -hmm. coffee consumption like a more ethically, um, you know, an, a more ethical choice, I suppose. I think there are lots of things we can do and you're absolutely right. Uh, coffee farming has been a major cause of deforestation and continues to be a major cause of deforestation. So we need to address that. We need to look at certification. We've got a, a plethora of certifications for coffee. None of those really factors in um, the environmental aspect. And we, you know, so there are coffees that that have caused def deforestation and may continue to cause deforestation. On the other hand, there are coffees that actually uh, might benefit the environment, particularly those that are grown within a, 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 um, a forest-like forest situation, you know, particularly those, uh, for example, in Ethiopia. And colleagues, um, academic colleagues of mine in Ethiopia often say that 
if there wasn't any coffee cultivation in Ethiopia, there wouldn't be any rainforest left. So I think we need to be um, we need to improve um, on 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 the public's awareness of of the, uh, their consumer choice in terms of you know the, the impact on the environment, and you know it, it, everything's interconnected. Um, we need to look at waste. We need to look at plastics and recycling, carbon usage, um, reduction of, of um, the use of carbon in, in the in the coffee value chain. Um, so, so maybe to, to wrap up, I, I just have to ask: as a coffee lover, as a coffee drinker myself, <laughs> you've studied coffee for. Um, I don't know, for, for what, like 30 years, as, as you mentioned, I, I found in my sort of consumption, I, I prefer coffees from Indonesia, Sulawesi and, and Sumatra just, you know, tend to agree with my palate the most, uh, with no offense mm. to uh, Ethiopia or, or Central America. What is the greatest coffee you've tasted in your life? <laughs> I, you know, I think that, uh, I think everybody should drink the coffee that they that they enjoy. Uh, you're avoiding and my question nobody, there, doctor. N- no, <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm going to come to that. But nobody should be saying this is the best coffee. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people uh, look upon uh, people who drink coffee with milk as, as, as uneducated. I don't agree with that. I think if you enjoy drinking coffee with milk or you enjoy drinking Indonesian coffee, then that's stick to it. Don't listen to anybody. Uh, my preference is African coffees. Uh, Ethiopians, uh, Ethiopian coffees are amazing, um, but Rwanda, um, uh, Kenyan, but there's some amazing coffees in, in Central America. I, I feel uh, like I'm asking you to choose yeah, a favorite child or something. Yeah, it's so difficult. And to be honest, you wouldn't, why would you want to stick to one coffee? It'd be like drinking one wine. I mean, it's just the, part, the diversity is just really part of its enjoyment, I think. So one week I'll be drinking Colombian or El Salvadorian. The next week it might be Burundi, uh, Kenya or, or Rwanda. So I think it's nice to chop and change and uh, really um, enjoy the diversity of coffee. I, I agree. I go to our, like the, these local hipster coffee shops and I like to just taste around. <laughs> Um, well, well, thank you, thank you so much for your time. This was and for your research. This was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and I just 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 throw in right at the end because I, this is really the elephant in the room is coffee prices. If we don't improve um, coffee prices, and if farmers, um, you know, continue to get low um, value for what they do, then that will have a big impact on, on coffee. Well, well, let me ask you. So, so, you know, I, I, I'm a fairly frugal person in general, but coffee definitely is my like extravagance. And so I'll routinely buy like $15 pounds of, of these kind of single origin coffees from, you know, Sumatra, Burundi or, or, or wherever. Mm-hmm. Is that like an adequate price or should I be paying more? Uh, I, d- I don't think it's so much the price. I think it's making sure that the farmer gets, gets the 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 the, the be- gets the benefit from you know that high value coffee and in some cases they don't um, so it, it you know it it, um, it really pays to understand you know exactly what the farmers are receiving you know when you when you buy that high value coffee um, I, it, I, in terms of the speciality trade uh, I think it's much less of an issue and I think farmers who who are supplying into speciality are are um the lucky ones i think it's the farmers that uh, supply the world's commodity coffee the bulk of the world's coffee that really suffer um because they are very much tied into the the commodity price which is um which is exceedingly low at the moment and a lot of farmers are either not making any money or are um are making a loss um, and if that continues, then you know that can't go on for very long before a farmer says, oh, "That's it. I'm not. I'm not going to be growing coffee anymore." Uh, well, Aaron Davis, thank you so much for your time. This was this was fascinating, and I will uh, post a, a link to your research on the website of the the podcast. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks very much. 
All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Dr. Aaron Davis. I, I should say one of my like favorite genres of podcast episodes that I do are when I interview the authors of these scientific and academic papers and have them explain in kind of layperson's terms the broader social and international significance of these kind of very targeted, narrowly focused scientific papers. So if you appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. And, and as I said earlier, in all seriousness, no, please do help me keep producing these kinds of episodes by supporting the show on Patreon. Uh, there are a host of rewards you can unlock, including access to my daily morning news clips service. And of course, as always, I thank you to the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. I don't know how far or how close that is from the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, uh, not knowing my uh, England geography too, too well, even though I lived there for a year. Um, I never really left London, though. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.